Sadhguru, this question is coming from uh, Commander Abhilash Tommy. Oh. He's an Indian naval officer, the first Indian to complete a solo, unassisted, non-stop circumnavigation under sail. He's also an Asia meditator who practiced Shambhavi every day on the boat during his trip. Hey, he must be some inspiration for all of you <laughs> So, two questions. The first one is, uh, I have uh, heard a discourse by you, Sadhguru, where you said that drinking excess water all through the day is not healthy. What if you don't drink water and you don't feel thirsty for days? Is that normal? The second question, the way the moon and the sun exert their influence on water bodies causing tides, do they also exert such influence on human and animal bodies? About uh, not drinking water, this must have happened to Abhilash when he was on the ocean. I want you to understand this, if being on the ocean for maybe two months or three months all by yourself, one man boat means you really have to be in tune with what's around you in many ways. In some ways where you can logically understand, in many ways that nobody understands but they know it works like that. Anybody who's been at sea for long periods of time, has this sense. Anybody who's flying for a certain period of time, they have a sense with the wind and the air in a certain way. Not all of it is scientific knowledge, not all of it is intellectually correct, but they just know that's how it is and it always works that way. Because like every other creature which lives in water, they know things which no naval officer will know. A dolphin or a whale or a shark knows things about the ocean and water and its behavior which no oceanographer knows in the world because it's not an intellectual understanding, you're part of that. So in some way, someone who wants to go around the world in a boat all by himself, in a sailboat without any engines or anything, Obviously, you get into tune with the water around you, otherwise it wouldn't really work for you. First of all, you wouldn't mentally survive that. Forget about physically making it. Mentally, you wouldn't survive that unless there is a certain affinity between you and that element. So, when you're in such a state, you, you know, uh, particularly being in the ocean, largely being in the sun, the respiration process in the skin is greatly enhanced when you're in a condition like that and you're on the water surface so naturally the humidity will be there. You're taking in water, not through your mouth but you're continuously taking in water. If you want to check, you check your weight, get into the bathtub, sit there for half an hour and check your weight, you will be certain number of grams higher because body will take in water. So, uh, <laughs> I had some nasty joke, I'll skip that <laughs> So, uh, this body does soak up water either with contact or with humidity in the air. So, this ability may not be same from one person to another, one person may be doing it at a higher rate than someone else. And uh, those of you who are getting all creamed up from head to toe, you must know this that in many ways you taking away your contact with the existence. Grease up the entire skin, it won't breathe. When it doesn't breathe, it's contact with air and water and world around you, your general sensitivity will go down. Your neuronal system, I mean your nervous system will lose its sensitivity because the contact, the outer, outermost contact is being blocked up. So, uh, the entire world is taking to this of course now to block themselves out because uh, they'll, uh, they'll contact the world through the Facebook of course. <laughs> Even the bears are going on the Facebook, I heard. So, 
that's different. But anyway, mm, your need for water might have come down quite dramatically because the humid conditions and your own openness to the element could have done that. And it's… if you don't feel thirsty, if you don't drink water, nothing is going to happen, you're going to be fine. It's only in America you will die if you don't drink water. <laughs> Nowhere else people simply drink water. When they get thirsty, they drink water, otherwise they're fine, even in a desert. <laughs> it's only in America, in cold climate, everybody's carrying a bottle and sipping continuously because uh, the marketing machines have done this to them that they must drink lots of water. Excessive consumption of water, especially if it's done in small sips, body absorbs, when it absorbs the sodium levels, which are very uh, delicately balanced, will drop. The rest of the body also is affected but may not be so noticeable, but in the brain, sodium levels dropping will lead to swelling of the brain. This does not mean your brain is growing. It means, swelling means it's a kind of sickness, okay? Not expansion of the brain, it's swelling up because of lack of sodium content. So because there's not enough sodium, more water goes into the brain, trying to supply the required sodium to keep the balance. So more water in your brain means you will slosh. Psychological imbalances, will come when… when you manage to absorb. See, if you drink lots of water at one go, body will decide how much to absorb, how much to throw out. But if you s keep sipping through the day, body kind of gets deceived and tends to absorb more water than it should. But let's say right now you drink two liters of water, all of it is not going to go into the system. What is needed, it'll take, rest of it will be shunted out. <clears throat> so, uh, not consuming water and being out there is very much a possibility. Nobody need to drink water simply because you think it's a good thing to do. That is what the water bottling companies are telling you, okay? When you feel thirsty, you must drink water just to ensure you're drinking enough. Drink ten percent more than what you actually need couple of cups more, just to ensure that you don't drink less. If you're not the kind who is uh, carrying a water bottle with you every minute of the day, then it's good to drink little extra water so that when the need comes, you have a certain amount of time before you can drink, that it's not an emergency. At the same time, when you need water, when you're thirsty if you don't drink, it'll cause damage to the system. I would say, this may be very controversial, the medical fraternity will for sure protest on this, but uh, they will come to it after maybe twenty years or thirty years. <laughs> I would say if everybody consumes good water in sufficient quantity, fifty percent of the heart attacks in the world would come down. The damage to the heart is immense when the water that is needed is not there in the system. But when I say water, it is not just about drinking liquid water, you must eat high water content foods. If you eat a fruit, it's nearly ninety percent water. Vegetables and other things are over seventy percent water. Minimum seventy percent water content must be there in the food that you eat. But in this part of the world, now it's changing of course, people are becoming more conscious about these things, otherwise in this part of the world, what people are eating is very dry food. Everything that is here is generally dry, only now. I, I think uh, twenty-five years ago, uh, in this part of the world, hardly people ate any vegetables. Vegetarians were beaten <laughs> on the streets. <laughs> yes, being a vegetarian is a crime. 
because they think you're weird <laughs> So, uh, very low water content food you eat and it goes and gets stuck in your… like concrete, it sits in your stomach. Now you drink water, 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 it, that's not going to help. You must eat high water content foods when you consume food, at least it must be level with the percentage of water content in your own body. So any food that you eat should be at least seventy percent uh, water content. So this is why vegetables, fruits must be part of your diet so that it is there. You eat bread, I don't know, it may be it's just twenty, twenty-five percent water content or even less, depending on the type of bread you eat. If you eat meat, it's very, very low water content. Cooked meat has very low water content. So, when you are on bread and meat, you will have serious issues and I'm telling you, <laughs> doctors may uh, think I'm… I need water up here, but they will come to this in twenty years, thirty years, whatever time they take. I will tell you if they consume high water content foods, fifty percent of the cardiac deaths will go from the world. People won't die of heart attacks. One reason they're dying of heart attacks is they're eating very low water content foods. So people may say, what about other countries? Why are they dying in India? They're also the same has happened. What used to be traditional meals and what they're eating today, it has changed dramatically because they're also ruled, ruled by commercial forces who tell them what to eat. They won't listen to their bodies. They look at the advertisement, the big hoarding or the television advertisement decides what you eat, not what your body tells what to eat. So, not consuming water in certain situations is okay, but if there is an indication of thirst, you must drink water. It's very necessary that you must drink water when there's an indication of thirst, because body has its own way. When it indicates you need water, you must give it water within twenty minutes or at least at the most half an hour, you must drink substantial quantity of water. If you drink enough water, then body will choose how much to take, how much to reject. What's the other question, I'm sorry? Oh. Both the sun and the moon have in vibrational impact and also gravitational impact on the water. Only the gravitational impact of the water is noticed by most people because a sailor <laughs> like Abhilas cannot sail. Okay, that's a small boat, it can sail any time, but if you have a big ship, you cannot sail without the tide. You cannot leave the port without the tide. Right from ancient times, sailors have always looked for tide. Without the tide, there is no question of sailing in the ocean without the help of the tide. So understanding when it comes up, when it goes down was very, very important. Generally, to put it in a very s simple terms, though the… <clears throat> see, it's the same gravitational pull which is managing planet Earth and Moon. But the centrifugal force of the rotation and the gravitational force somehow are so perfectly balanced that they're holding on together. But actually, the center of the mass is in one place, it's not in two places. So it's one gravity managing two bodies, two celestial bodies. You know, planet Earth is also a celestial body. It's a heavenly body, you're in heaven, missing the whole point. <laughs> if you were looking, if you were standing on planet Mars, Earth would look like heaven or no? It is a heavenly body and for sure the best planet on the… in the system at least, in this solar system. It is for sure heaven in this solar system, isn't it? Okay, we're messing it up, that's different but it can fix itself. If we vanish, it'll fix itself pretty good. If 
fifty, sixty percent of the human beings disappear somewhere, let's say they go to Mars. <laughs> you will see planet Earth will just revitalize itself and flourish in a big way, because she still has water, water has not been lost, you know? All of you are water bottles. <laughs> you… you little more than them, but <laughs> this is a water body, isn't it? Huh? Seventy percent water is just shaken, see? <laughs> so, seven point three billion people, let's say on an average, all of them weigh sixty kilograms. I'm not taking into the heavyweights, taking into account the heavyweights, but let's say on an average sixty kilograms everybody weighs. Out of sixty, at least forty kilograms of water, that means forty liters of water per person carrying. Forty liters into seven point three billion. How many liters? It's almost an ocean by itself. So where is the water? It's all here. <laughs> it's never left the atmosphere and gone anywhere. The volume of water that was here a billion years ago is still here, but uh, all in un unworthy packages <laughs> So, uh, the impact of the sun and the moon, the gravitational impact is noticed, but the reverberational impact is not largely felt by people, but uh, the Eastern societies have seen this in a… as an immense possibility and making use… how to make use of Pavnami and Amavasya, the full moon, the new moon is an entire process by itself. If you do not know this, before the British came to India, Pavnami means or full moon means three days holiday. Amavasya means, new moon means two days holiday. So totally five days holiday in a month. No Sunday, Monday and all this stuff, only by looking at the moon. Because this is not just arithmetic calculation, this is a life-related thing that's happening. Whatever happens to the moon, whatever happens to the sun, whatever happens to the planet, happens to us. And to be in tune with that, those days you're not supposed to work. You use those days to stabilize yourself, balance yourself, raise yourself to higher possibilities and other days you go to work. So, uh, these two days or even in between in different phases, it has different kind of impacts. What is generally noticed is rising of the water in the form of a tide. Suppose yesterday the high tide was, let's say, at 9.30. Do we have a few more minutes because we started late? Yesterday it started at 9.30. Today it will be at 10.20 because there is a fifty-minute lapse between the moon's way of doing things and the earth's way of doing things. This does it in twenty-four hours, that does it in twenty-four hours and fifty minutes. So. There's approximately forty-eight to fifty minutes of difference in the t high tide from one day to the next. So, when you look at this every… every monthly monthly cycle, it becomes a complex affair to calculate and to be. Today, of course, it's all being done in a digital way through the satellites. Otherwise, a sailor had to have a very complex kind of arrangement in his head as to how this is, because if you don't know this, you won't survive. Many… almost every creature of the sea knows this very well, and the birds which migrate know this very well, and there's some incredible facts about the navigating birds which travel or which migrate during certain seasons and get back as to how they manage this entire process, the water, the the gravitational pull of the moon, it affects the flying objects too, particularly when you're flying on your own power, flapping your wings. Even slightest movement in the gravitation and the reverberation affects them. How they manage this, how they go through this is a very, very interesting story, not just birds, even insects.
because dragonflies in southern India every year make a trip to East Africa and come back. How's that for you? Safari. <laughs> Dragonfly, this big. Every year they go all the way to East Africa, breed there, then come up and multiply their numbers about three or four times and come back to India. <laughs> and they know the way, they've never missed the way. All the way they go and come back every time. But now the navigational activity on the big ships and airplanes, they're disturbing them. And many of them are losing their way because the reverberations have changed. One big jet goes and it completely disturbs and freaks their ability to navigate. That's happening to I think every creature inc including human beings. That uh, whatever we were capable of naturally is all going away because of too many gadgets doing things and too many vibrations happening around us, sensitivity will become less and less. About the influence on the human mind, human body, the maximum impact of these planetary objects upon water and the maximum impact is on the human being, not on the other creatures, because we are vertical in our spine. If we were like this, it wouldn't impact us to the same extent. Because we are like this, we are a stand-up bottle. Because of that, the pull is big and the rise of the water affects us quite substantially. We know that uh, it disturbs certain people, certain people get headaches on full moon days, some people get mentally disturbed and all these things. The moon or the position of the moon or the gravitational impact of the moon does not cause either mental imbalance or headache or any other problem. It only rises, it only enhances you on that day because there is more pressure upon your brain, there is more flow of fluids into the brain. If you are loving, you will become far more loving. If you are joyful, you become far more joyful. If you're miserable, you become far more miserable. If you're meditative, you become far more meditative. If you're mad, you become far more mad. It is not trying to bring any particular quality, it is just that the waters are rising. Because of that, whatever is your quality right now gets enhanced. So, the impact of different positions of the moon and sun upon the human body is phenomenal. If we go into the details of it, it's an entire process of itself. As I said, generally people are noticing only the gravitational impact upon the water, but not the vibrational impact. But today there are lots of studies telling you that if you create different kinds of vibrations or different kind of sounds, the water responds in different ways. I don't know if we have that video with us, do we? Can we play this? So, depending upon the type of sounds we create, accordingly the water takes on different shapes and forms and patterns which are very geometrically correct kind of patterns for different sounds. And uh, you know uh, that the Sheffield University first did this a few years ago. Now people are telling me NASA has published something that uh, talking about they recorded the sound of the sun. Have you heard about this? Hmm? So clearly sound arm is coming. So these things are not new to us. These things something we have noticed because every cell in this body is solar powered, okay? You may call it so many things, but essentially whether you burn coal or you burn diesel or petrol or nuclear energy, whatever the hell you do, essentially all of it is solar energy converted and stored in different ways, isn't it? If there is no sun, there would be no hydrocarbons for sure. There's no question about that. So everything that's happening in nature, whatever shapes and forms that different uh, life forms are taking is essentially largely related to how the water reverberates, including yourself. How the water is reverberating within yourself, that is the kind of form 
both the physical form and the psychological form that you take is largely dependent upon this and uh, thank you very much.